Bye. <laughs> okay. So, hello everyone. I'm talking about RFID hacking because I recently started a semester work at school and I wanted to break our school license. But um, so when I was started with all of that, I put together all of the information that might have been um, good to have before I started. Um, so in case you want to play around with RFID in the near future, um, this could help you. Um, just a quick overview, um, the first steps I want to show you, what you uh, need to look after, and then the RFID technology you need to know, because there are just a few basic things to understand the concept, um, then what else is possible afterwards. And then I put together a few RFID readers and what the differences are and what might be possible or good for you to use. Um, and I put them in some nice groups and um, those groups that are put here together and all of the information is actually, it's really not um, a full list of all the possibilities. It's just the stuff I stumbled upon. Um, so what you first need to define is what is your, uh, what is your goal? Because um, if you just want to build your own home uh, RFID system, which many people seem to do, um, you do you need different uh, specifics and di different features than if you want to, for example, read a card that you have. Um, and also if you want to learn about the technology, you might want to choose a different reader than um, if you want to like hack a card. Um, also, there are many different standards available and they have different features. So for example, there are more complicated ones, ones with, with um, more memory to store stuff on, but they also do have different encryptions available on those cards. And um, for example, the Desfire cards, the MyFair De Desfire ones, they have a chip involved, so it's actually quite heavy to break that because it does have more features. What I'm now focusing on are the ones on high frequency, the 13.56 megahertz ones, the 1K MyFair. Um, they are also part of the ISO 14443 standard. And um, this, is, this is the one um, type of card that is mostly distributed and are, it's like the one most used out there. So it's very possible that if you got a MyFair card from some vendor that you got one of those. Now about this card, um, it does have uh, 16 sectors, each does have four blocks. The last block of each sector has an access key. Um, up to two access keys per sector are uh, possible and they might have different permissions that's actually by the vendor to be decided. Um, the first block usually has the UID which is on common cards fix and you can't change. Um, so that's why it's right protected. And um, the general 1K cards do have the Crypto 1 encryption, but the Crypto 1 encryption is broken, as you most probably know from a few last CCC talks. So you also find the links and everything on the Wikipedia page about how to break it exactly. Now, for the authentication, what you need to know is um, that as soon as um, your card does get into close proximity of a reader, um, it wants to authenticate. So it sends the first request. The card responds with the UID that it has. It's just, just like the default protocol, it always does that. And what then the reader does is send back the UID card, uh, uh, the UID information and the sector key. And now the sector key, I tried to brute force that, you might not want to do that. Because um, uh, it's, I quickly started it and measured up and it would have been taken about 100,000 years so um, you don't want to do that. Um, but as soon as you have the right sector key, um, the card sends back the information from that sector that you specifically asked for. And afterwards it's possible to send further information or ask for further information or to send further comments because for example there are uh, specific comments to increase for example a number that is stored in that um, MyFair. Uh, in that slot. Um, and then you'll get for sure the replies and stuff. Um, so what you can do as soon as you have your stuff set up, um, you first want to do that authentication key and there are default keys available. I put uh, a website with a list of default keys in the reference section. Um, this might be helpful in case you don't have it yet. Yeah, like I said, you don't want to try the brute force, but um, what you can do 
is you can eavesdrop on the communication. For that, you need an antenna and a receiver. And not all of the readers do have that feature. And, um, oh well, no, they can do that, but the emulating part is actually the very complicated or more, yeah, the more complicated part. Um, so for that, you might need to be able to have specific hardware. Um, at first, like a few years ago, they had the open PICC for that. Um, I'm coming to that in a moment, but you, most people use the Proxmark free. Um, as soon as you have the authentication key, you're able to read, that, read the data block which is most probably encrypted, but as I said, the, this encryption is just the crypto one on the typical ones, and this can be broken. So information about is that is also in the reference section. Um, so, and what you else can do is you can clone a card. Now, with the cloning card, as the UID is usually fixed on the general cards you get, um, you need to get special cards. Um, they are sometimes called magic cards from China, but you can also find them with the keywords MyFair, Classic, UID, and eBay. Um, and then you can get the key for the first sector, and then you can change that uh, UID. So that's what you need um, <coughs> for actually be able to clone a card. Um, it's also funny because some vendors, um, they say that you can't clone a card because of this unique um, card, uh, unique IDs that aren't able or aren't possible to change. Well, it's, I don't know in what world they live, but um, yeah, import from China isn't that difficult. Um, now if, to the readers. I started my reader project with an Arduino RFID reader, which I found out is like the most complicated one. So um, I had most experience with that. The good thing about uh, Arduino or Raspberry Pi shields is that they are combined to the standards, to the ISO standard, which you want to have, because you want to use the same comments and stuff to make all, the, all, all of the communication. Um, but um, it's really hard work because <laughs> you need to write the protocol code all yourself. It's possible that some people put stuff up on GitHub, but you need to really look for that and might need some luck. Um, but uh, though I found out that, um, for example, the XP reader is sold by Ada as well, Lady Ada and her aid, um, Ada shop. And she does have a GitHub um, web page also with a lot of code. So um, you might want to start look there first. Um, some of the readers do have hardware limitations, which is nasty if you only find that out afterwards. Because, <laughs> uh, for example, the Seed Studio RFID module, if you want to uh, read the data section, it does have a hardware limitations where it only reads 80 um, bytes and not the 256 that would be available, which is yeah, a little sad. Um, and the quality of the documentation, it really does vary. You need to make sure first to find out if you have a good documentation available and how good the whole reader is developed still, so you don't hang on the wrong places afterwards. Now the intermediate readers, I call them, because um, they are uh, a little more expensive, but also um, they have a little more support there. And um, so the ACR 122U is the one that is used with the backtrack manuals. I'm not sure if you saw them, but um, this card reader has been proven to be working and is re working with the drivers and everything, so it's probably easy to set up. Um, I once installed the stuff for the open PCD reader. It's the one that is famous from all the CCC talks. Um, well, the problem with that one I had was that it was only running on 32 bits um, architectures. And um, I think they now build up all the new versions, so they're now in version 2, which uh, is also able to emulate tax. The first version wasn't able to do that, if I remember right. And um, they now have like trainings available um, that they make at different conferences. And they also have a live system that you can just boot into, which makes the whole driver part really easy to get started. Um, and it's not that, um, that much more expensive than the Arduino ones, so it's probably good to have a look at. And um, just the prices are the ones from the country that the reader is originally from, so that's why I kept them like this. Um, now the Proxmark Free is the one that I call the deluxe version, because uh, it doesn't only have the biggest or uh, the most features. It does have a big active community. It uh, supports different uh, frequencies, like high and low frequency, depending on the antenna you use. You can get them separately. 
Um, it also supports emulating, cloning, and eavesdropping. And it does have a really nice forum where you can discuss with other people what the experiences they had. And if you have issues with setting anything up, they can basically help you. Um, but um, it's also the most expensive one. So you might get bundles at different stores, but uh, this is the one you're going to pay most for. Um, although this price now is for the enclosed version, if you want to have the one without the body around, it's uh, quite a bit cheaper. Then. So you might, might want to have a look at that. And it really gives you the most options, so that's a good uh, reason to stick for that one. Uh, so, And here are the references. I put those um, papers all together because um, they were helpful to me. They were explaining a lot of the basics and stuff behind um, to be able to crack stuff. And um, you might just want to go through that in case you're interested. So um, I'm already done. Do you have any questions? Yes. Did you do any tests like just using a $10 SDR USB stick to see if you can just drop on your FID communications? No, no. I actually just had um, my Arduino set up at home and the student license and everything and uh, I tried playing around with that mostly. And uh, uh, I didn't get to the whole um, uh, public readers yet because I'm officially not allowed to do that. So I'm probably going to shift my focus off the talk or of the, um, the, the, the study that I do um, uh, towards an RFID game. Because um, that might be easier with the NDAs, and um, yeah, so yeah. yeah. How practical is the eavesdropping? What sort of kit would you need for that? Well, the eavesdropping, the biggest problem is probably the antenna and how far you can reach. And there are different antennas, uh, also privately built, that are able to support longer length than the ones officially allowed. And but that's probably up to your. Um, imagination <laughs> and there have been many talks that have proven that it's possible to read that information over more or bigger distances yes um, if there was one kind of reader that you would suggest for someone who's looking to get into RFID which of the, the suggestions would you, would you go for well if you want to learn about the protocol then I would go for the Arduino still um, the XP one actually because it does have a really nice documentation and with nice uh, scripts ready to use um, and also like a nice forum as well with other and um, but if you want to have it easy and just get the job done then I will go with the Proxmark 3 yes what's the legality of all this in terms of public space eavesdropping because that hasn't been mentioned at all here when obviously people shouldn't be doing that well those in the UK or EU? I don't know about the UK law because <coughs> I'm not from here. But um, I mean, I've gotten into this whole thing from the technology point of view because I wanted to understand how it works. Um, legally, there are issues because most vendors, if they s give out a card, they expect you to behave well. And um, so you always need to make sure before you start a, an investigation or something or before you want to learn more about it, um, if it's all right with that vendor. But um, it's hard because it's so easy exposed. And mm. they, I mean, I don't know how they try to or how, why they want to protect it and how they want to get that uh, ensured. So what are you actually recovering from the car? Are you actually recovering a pin ID from it that you actually, is that the ultimate game to actually get the car, clone the car and, and to prove that you can get the pin ID so you can get access to a building or something? Well, you can do that. Um, also, I've heard that some vendors actually suggest to the people they're selling their products to that they just need to improve the software that is running on the back and doing the checks. So, if in, for example, those cards are used as student licenses, as public transport um, thingies and that, I don't know. Um, yeah. But um, uh, if you use it, for example, paying for your food at a cantina, um, which is a common thing, um, then they suggest that the software in the back the, that does do the credit uh, the, the transactions, the checks for it, it um, checks if you always have like the same amount of uh, money on the card. And if some person always shows up with the same amount of money, then there might be a problem. So this is the way they try to handle it, which is horrible, but... Uh, 
That's just my personal opinion. So. Yeah. Do you have anything with the RSI tokens, the bank tokens? No. Nope. Just curious. No. Nope. Are there any more questions? Because in case not, then I um, would like to thank you for your attention and thank you to Chris for being a great mentor and um, have fun with playing around. Thank you.